Is, is yes. five, five minutes enough? Five minutes, yeah. absolutely. I'd really just like to talk about the the, the, the basic issues yep. that your your group um, yep. is working on. Um, yep. I don't know if I suggested it to you or to you. My father has been teaching earth sciences at USC for 53 years. Yep. Uh, I grew up going out in the field with my father. I've got a lot of... Um, Background. I'm obviously not a scientist, but uh, I understand the dynamics, global dynamics to a certain extent. I understand geology. I understand weather patterns enough to realize at this point in time that this methane issue that I think we're facing right now is one of the biggest issues of our time. And I don't feel as though um, enough people are aware of it. I don't feel as though governments and organizations and institutions are paying enough attention to it. And yet I feel like, again, it's one of the issues of our time. So I know you've been working on this for quite some time. Yep. Can you give us a very quick overview of the Arctic methane emergency, as you would call it, and what it means to us and what potentially we can do about it in the near term? Yes, well, the, the big thing about the, uh, the methane is that it, it's going to come out eventually, and there's vast quantities of it. Uh, the carbon, mm -hmm. and because it will be generally coming out in anaerobic conditions without oxygen, it will, uh, the carbon will be emitted uh, as, as methane on carbon dioxide. Now, there's, uh, under the land permafrost, uh, there's enough uh, carbon uh, to, to triple the quantity in the atmosphere. Which, yeah. which from what I understand, would be devastating. I mean... If it, even if it was CO2, it would be pretty devastating. But if it's methane, we have to think about a uh, 20 year time scale, not 100 year time scale, because the critical thing is if we can, uh, if we can sort out this problem within the next 20 years, yeah. then we can be on, we can get onto a, a decent path and a sustainable yeah, uh, system. I mean, I've seen data just in the last couple of weeks coming off of methanetracker.org, which is showing concentrations in the higher reaches of the atmosphere mm -hmm. at almost 3,000 parts per billion, mm -hmm. um, which seem like massive spikes compared to um, data from just even a couple of years ago. Is that what you guys are seeing? Well, the first, there are people saying that the uh, that the methane isn't. Uh, Growing from the Arctic, like the Russian who, who, who came right. to, to our meeting. Right. Uh, but I think the, the evidence is that it's growing. Uh, how fast it's growing is very difficult to say. Natalia Sakova admitted that they don't have time series really. Mm -hmm. um, so they can't say that they've looked at one spot and it's grown by this much over. Uh, five or ten years, which is, would be the last thing to know. Right, so it's, it's been very difficult for scientists to really put their finger on this, the quantities that have been released through natural processes in the Arctic region, and with a little bit warming, with the warming that we're seeing now, it's, it's, I guess it's what you're saying is it's difficult to discern what the change and the release has been over the last couple of years, yeah. and difficult to, to pinpoint what the cause of it would be even. So yes. it seems uh, that there has been a, uh, in, uh, an increase in the global level of uh, since 2006, mm -hmm. and it's gone up, it's gone shooting up. Uh, but that anomaly can probably explain by some wetlands being, you know, inundation in Af Africa causing vast areas of wetlands which produce methane. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we can't pin that down to being Arctic. Uh, uh, but the, the levels are very dramatically high in, in, right. in, in, in Arctic, in, in particular hot spots. Uh, yes. um, now, if you try and say, well, is this contributing to global warming? Um, yes, but very little. So far? A, a, a tiny bit. Okay. Now, it would have to escalate two or three orders of magnitude to get uh, uh, comparable to CO2. Because mm -hmm. um, there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere. It would, you're saying it would have to 
um, compound itself by magnitudes of three to four to reach the, the CO, current no, CO2 no, orders, emissions? Or two or three orders of magnitude, 100 to 1,000 times. 100 to 1,000 times. What it's emitting at the moment, because they're okay. talking about uh, uh, eight uh, megatons per year. Right. Now, if that got went up to 800, uh, we'd be close to the um, uh, the gigaton level, right. and the gigaton level is roughly the level at which it, it, it overtakes CO2. Right. Uh, so taking into consideration an ice-free Arctic uh, in the next three to four years, let's say, mm -hmm. and, and a one degree warming of the Arctic oceans, mm -hmm. it, it, is, it, is, the, is there a pretty good likelihood that we could start seeing these gigaton releases, or do you still think that this is something that is decades away before uh, the oceans warm enough till we really start seeing this kind of massive methane plumes you know all over the Arctic region and causing uh, catastrophic uh, harm to uh, our environment well I think I, I distrust the IPCC uh, process because their projections on the warming are are so uh, wrong. So, <laughs> so wrong right uh, even their worst case scenario is uh, unrealistic because it doesn't take account of what's happening in the Arctic. Right. Um, um, the Arctic temperature is going to go shooting up uh, by uh, 10 degrees uh, or, or, or more uh, really quite quickly. Um, and when you're getting temperature increase like that, the, the, the permafrost will, will um, no. Uh, thaw, thaw away They're very, very quickly, much quicker than it right. is at the moment. So is there, there is the mechanism to get uh, Right. I, I, it sure seems as though there is. Uh, yeah. um, and, and, and with that 8 or 10 degrees warming that you're talking about, that would also release, I would imagine, a large portion of the methane hydrates as, as well, yeah. too, yeah. right? So yeah. that there is the possibility for this catastrophic uh, Runaway uh, self amplification happening in the Arctic and ultimately yeah. this massive methane release. Yeah. <laughs> I'm we, deeply we, concerned we, about it. You obviously are yes, as well, too. We, we, don't, we have no idea whether it's going to be 10, 20, 50, 100 years. Right. The point is that it will happen. It will happen. It's almost inevitable. It's happened before, right? It didn't happen 55 happened. million years ago? Yeah, yeah exactly. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, when it happened 55 million years ago, there was a doubling of CO2, atmospheric CO2 concentrations in a very short period of time. And then it seems as though then this massive methane release coincided with the doubling of the CO2 concentrations. Mm -hmm. And it sounds, this is short period of time of 13 or 15 years, got um, a pretty substantial well, uh, extinct. I, I have read that uh, the, the CO2 warming probably increased the ocean temperature at uh, depth by about two degrees, and that was enough to cause all the methane hydrate throughout the, uh, the globe uh, uh, to, to be released. Right. Um, uh, and, and then it's self amplifying until it's all gone. Right. Um, so we don't know the time scale, but what we do know uh, is that if we don't cool the Arctic and break the vicious cycle, warming now, right. and we're into this warming uh, from the Arctic, which is going to uh, release the methane. Right. Uh, and, and it's irreversible. Totally it's irreversible. irreversible. Once, once you've got Arctic melting, meltdown, you won't be able to get the ice back. Right. And so the Arctic will no longer serve its function as uh, uh, cooling the planet. The refrigerator and, and, uh, of the planet. Uh, and, um, and, and it controls the climate change. Uh, the, the, color of the climate in the northern hemisphere is controlled by having a uh, considerable temperature differential between the uh, between the equator and the Arctic. And once that differential uh, um, uh, uh, disappears or is really significantly reduced, you start getting weather systems moving in different patterns, the sure. jet streams changing. And this is, this is why you're getting lots of uh, extreme weather in the northern hemisphere, and why crops are failing. And the US has, has had extremes, you know, like periods of drought, and 
and then the periods of floods yeah. so on. So and, and we can expect those conditions to accelerate yeah. Uh, yeah, dramatically, I would yeah. imagine, even in the next couple of years, I, yeah. I would imagine, we'll it's see. It's very likely to have a food crisis, a major food crisis in the next few years. Right, so, so coupled um, with the uh, ocean acidification, um, just warming of, of the Arctic and, and the planet in general, the, the methane issue, these are all incredibly serious issues. And I feel as though they're not being taken seriously um, at, at governmental levels. And, and um, the IPCC seems to be just glazing over a lot of these very, very important issues. Is it because of the political pressure that exists on the IPC that we're not getting real accurate information? Or what, what's the problem with the IPCC? Because it seems as though they have good intentions, and yet it doesn't seem like we're really getting honest, accurate information. That's my opinion, but what are your thoughts well, about that? It's very much gets out of their comfort zone. You know, they've been working on the basis that things are going to take a hundred years. Uh, and that, that seems to pervade the thinking. Um, yeah. there, are, there are lots of uh, procedural constraints. So they're, they're only allowed to take um, papers that are published and have been peer reviewed. Right. And then you find that the, the papers that have been more extreme scenarios, the more scary ones, don't get published. Right. So, the, so there's a vicious kind of cycle right. of suppression right. uh, built into the procedural system yes. for IPCC. Um, Which is, could be disastrous um, for... Um, uh, and then, they, <laughs> remember, it's an intergovernmental right. organization. <laughs> so uh, what's happened, I know what I heard from you is about the AR4 report. Uh, was the scientists, the non-governmental scientists, came up with lots of things, and then the government uh, people came in and watered everything down. Right. Uh, I don't know whether that's happened uh, this time, but certainly these glaring emissions, which we we pointed out, and we, uh, the Russian who was here, uh, was saying that uh, there are. You know, Everything is there. You just got to, re to re read it carefully. Right. And he's absolutely wrong. We re we have read right. it carefully. We read right. it very carefully. Right. And we did word searches on methane and, and various mm. uh, keywords, and, mm. and, and, and it's not there. It's just not there. Right. So the and, IPCC, and the in that sense, is doing us a great disservice because if these issues are as critical as we think they are, and they're not being addressed by the one large, you know, um, international organization that's supposed to be looking at these issues mm -hmm. seems as though uh, we're going to fall way short of the actions yeah, that are necessary. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, are you guys yeah, importing new people? In as time okay. Um, well, that was fantastic. Yeah. Sorry we didn't get a chance to chat more. Yeah. Um, we'll be um, in touch. Yes. Uh, did you, uh, you got a copy of our the documentary that we put together, right? Yes. So it has my contact information on there. Yep. Um, and I think we probably have it as well, too. But. Um, Thank you very much for your, your good work. Yeah. I know it's it's difficult. Um, uh, when I put this document documentary together, I was uh, it was very difficult for me to do because I think the consequences of inaction at this point in time are are, are grave, mm -hmm. and uh, it scares me uh, immensely to think that we as a species and uh, as a, a collective don't have what it takes to pull ourselves out of this mess. But um, Hopefully, with the good work that you are doing and uh, other organizations that you're associating with, we can wake people up and uh, start doing what needs to be done. Yes, uh, there's, there's one thing I uh, think I'd like to leave okay. you with, and Please. the thought that if we if we actually do uh, grasp the metal and do this, it will actually be a rather an exciting I agree. project. I agree. Uh, and everybody will get excited by actually seeing something done which works. Imagine that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and collaboration. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, we would be, I would very much like to be a part of anything that you guys do in the future. So um, hopefully we can stay in contact. And um, it was a pleasure meeting you all um, here in San Francisco. Well, thank you very much. I smile for the camera. <laughs> thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Sorry to keep you. We're out of here. Thanks, John. And John, um,